Let's talk about series, or how to work with a sum having an infinite number of terms. Here's the plan. We're going to introduce the idea of a series, which is just a sum of an infinite collection of numbers. We're going to try to understand why a series is such a subtle creature. Then we're going to define a very important auxiliary notion of sequence of partial sums. And then we're going to build our notion of convergence and divergence for a series off of this notion of a sequence of partial sums. So here's the definition of series. We'll start with a sequence, an. Now, if you have a sequence, you can just think of it as an ordered list. And then one of the things you could do with this list is you could just insert plus signs between each term. And so a very natural question is, what happens when we try to add together the terms of a given sequence? This gadget we get, we call this an infinite series, or simply a series um, is often sufficient. Um, it's implicit that we would be talking about an infinite collection of terms when we talk about a series. So an infinite series is simply an attempt to add up the terms of some sequence. And attempt is the key word here because it's, it's not obvious that this attempt should succeed or fail. In fact, we have to figure out the conditions under which we're going to declare victory or defeat in such an attempt to add up the terms of a sequence. There are some series which uh, should behave pretty obviously. I mean, if we looked at this series where we tried to add up the constant sequence zero, the terms of the constant sequence zero, zero plus zero plus zero, etc. Well, we really expect this, if, if a series means anything at all intuitive, we expect this series to add up to zero. And similarly, we would expect this series that starts one plus and then adding successfully zero after that, we would expect this to equal one. Similarly, we would expect the series one plus one plus one plus one, etc that really doesn't deserve to add up to any particular number. In fact, it seems that in some sense this better equal infinity uh, if that has a meaning. So these are, these are uh, series behaviors that we imagine should be true, whatever we decide upon for our definition of, of uh, dealing with a series. And this series right here actually brings up a lot of great issues. So let's start with this in our discussion, really um, examine what's going on here. The question is, what is the sum of 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1, etc.? Now let's rewrite this. Let's, let's make it a strict sum. So we're going to be adding up alternating terms, either 1 or negative 1. So the question is, what is 1 plus negative 1 plus 1 plus negative 1, etc.? You can imagine one response to this question. One response could be, well, we know addition is associative. So therefore, we could add up pairs next to each other. And obviously, all these pairs add up to 0. And so we would expect this series to be the same as 0 plus 0 plus 0, etc. And we know that's going to be 0. So our response here is that this sum should equal 0. Great. But now you can imagine response B. And response B starts the same way. Yes, I agree, addition is associative. Therefore, by associating these pairs of terms, we know that the original series should equal 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0, etc. And we know that series had better equal 1. Now, that seems reasonable as well, and so one wonders what's going on, because obviously this cannot be equal both to 0 and 1, but it actually gets more interesting than that because another response could be, well, addition's associative and it's commutative. Therefore, we could swap pairs in order, get a new series, associate these pairs, and now we get 2 plus 0 plus 0, etc., and we know that should be equal to 2. Now, we seem to be getting multiple choice responses here and it actually gets even more interesting than that. Pick your favorite integer n, positive or negative. So for example, you could choose n equals negative 3. And you start with your series, and you apply the commutativity law once, and you apply it again, and you apply it again, and now these three terms add up to negative 1, 
plus negative one plus negative one equals negative three. And the rest can be associated in such a way as to get zero plus zero plus zero. And now you get negative three. You can imagine how to vary this argument to come to the conclusion that given any integer n, positive or negative, there's a way to rearrange the original series and apply the associative law to obtain n as your sum. In other words, the sum of this series can be any integer you wish. So this game's really gone off the rails. I mean, infinite series aren't going to be very useful if it turns out that some of them could be equal to anything we want. Something strange is going on, and we need to come to grips with what that is. What went wrong? Well, addition is a binary operation. That's something to keep in mind. It's, it's so simple, but so important, it's easy to overlook. A plus sign really only makes sense when you're trying to add two sumands, a plus b. And sure, you add three numbers all the time, but why does this sort of, why is this not a controversial issue when you add three numbers? Well, think about it this way. If it's a binary operation, you need to add two things at one time. So you could add a plus b, and then you could add c. But of course, you could also add b plus c and add a. And the fact of the matter is, you're always going to get the same number. And this reflects the fact that addition is associative. It doesn't matter how you group these things. But notice, we're only talking about three numbers here. We can extend this to any finite sum of real numbers. And the property of associativity in this context says, given any finite sum of real numbers, any correct arrangement of parentheses yields the same value. So for example, suppose we had four sumands. You can convince yourself that there are five ways of associating pairs to apply addition in a binary sense. There's just five ways to group these things as written. And of course, it's true that any one of these groupings is going to give you the same number. That's the point of associativity. What's interesting about this is it doesn't follow immediately from the fact that a plus b plus c can be grouped any way you want. You have to apply some sort of proof by induction on the number of sumands to get to the general result. But this associativity property applies to any finite sum of real numbers. It doesn't apply necessarily to an infinite sum. We were wrong to try to extend the associativity to an infinite collection of numbers all at one shot. So what happens is a sum, a finite sum, is unambiguous. We don't have to worry about grouping for a finite sum, but we can't make the leap to an infinite sum. Now, similar comments apply to the commutativity property. Addition is commutative. And we can leap right to the general property for a finite collection of real numbers. The sum of these numbers in any order yields the same value. So, for example, when n equals 3, there are six ways to order the sum. Of course, each of these sums individually is unambiguous because of the associativity property, but it's commutativity that tells you all six of these expressions gave you the same number. Once again, the commutative property applies fundamentally to the sum of two numbers, and you can use a proof by induction to show that it works for any finite collection of numbers. And once again, we're not allowed to make this leap to an infinite collection of real numbers. So the moral here is the usual tools, associativity, commutativity, they don't necessarily exist for infinite series. So we can't work with the whole sum all at once. What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to base our understanding of a series as the limiting case of something we understand. In other words, we have to somehow go from finite sums to a definition of an infinite series. Now the key tool for this is going to be the sequence of partial sums. So that's the critical definition here. Just like secant slopes were the key definition for limiting values of secant slopes giving you tangent slopes, just like Riemann sums were the fundamental thing that we're going to take the limiting value to get integrals, partial sums, the sequence of partial sums, is the fundamental tool we're going to use as a bridge to get to convergence of a series. So let's define very carefully what we mean by a sequence of partial sums. You take your series and you build a new sequence from the series in a very straightforward way. The first term in the sequence is going to be simply the first term of your series. We'll call it sigma 1. Sigma 1 is a1. Sigma 2 is going to be the sum of the first two terms. Sigma 3 will be the sum of the first three terms, and so on. So we will simply add one more term each time, and in this way you can construct a new sequence. And this sequence 
is what we call the sequence of partial sums associated to the original series. This is of fundamental importance. This is what you look at in theory when you want to understand the behavior of an infinite series. So let's just build the sequence of partial sums starting with some series here. This is called the harmonic series. We're going to revisit this in the future. But right now our job is simple. We're just going to construct the sequence of partial sums associated to this series. First partial sum is easy. It's just one. The second partial sum, we'll, let's use the, let's get the calculator into the game. So the second partial sum is 1.5, and then we can keep adding each new term to the, to the current running total, so to speak. And you can see how the sequence of partial sums basically keeps track of your running total, if you like. It's a very easy notion. It's, uh, you look at your, any partial sum is just telling you what at that point the, the series added up to, to that point. So a sequence of partial sums you can think of as a running total of the terms um, inside the series. So now we're ready to define what it means for a series to converge. Given a series, you can build a sequence of partial sums in the manner just described. Now what happens if you found out that the sequence of partial sums converges to some limiting value? We'll call it L. If that's true, then what we will say is that the series itself converges to L. Now think about what this means. All you're saying is the more terms you keep adding, the closer your running total gets to some sort of limiting value. That's exactly what it means. It's a very intuitive thing to uh, sort of hope for. In fact, what we'll do is we will make the arrow point both ways. We'll make this an if and only if. This is our fundamental definition. We say the series converges if and only if its sequence of partial sums converges. And of course, we'll say that a series diverges if and only if its sequence of partial sums diverges. Let's take a look at another example that we're going to study quite carefully in the future. This is an example of a geometric series. 1 plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth. You'll notice that each term in the series is a power of a half, or 1 over a power of 2. 1 over 2, 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 2 cubed, etc. To visualize the partial sums, we're going to use some geometry here. So we're going to, we're going to take two squares. Each has unit length for a side. And if we do that, then you'll notice that the first partial sum turns out to just be the area of the first square. The second partial sum, being 3 halves, is the uh, area of the first square plus half of the second square. The third partial sum will be the first square plus half the second square plus a quarter of the second square. And you can see what's happening here is we keep dividing what's left and adding that to the running total to get your partial sum. Now, let's leave this as an exercise, but there's a way to come up with a clever formula for the partial sum using this picture. The general formula for the nth partial sum is obtained by simply saying, well, let's take the whole rectangle of area 2 and simply subtract off what we need to leave behind the partial sum. And the exercise is for you to go in and carefully make sure that this works for the given series. So when n equals 1, for instance, you should convince yourself that you get the proper partial sum of 1, and so on. But this, in fact, works. And this formula is really convenient, because now we have an explicit formula to work with to examine the limiting value of the partial sum. The limit of the partial sum, in this case, the limit of the sequence of partial sums, is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 minus 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. And using standard limit laws for sequences, we see that 2 to the n minus 1 which diverges to infinity means that 1 over 2 to the n minus 1 goes to 0, and that means our limit of the sequence of partial sums is equal to 2. And by definition, that means that this series converges to 2. So let's return to this question that we started with. What is the sum of 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1, etc.? Clearly what we should do is look at the sequence of partial sums. Now, the sequence of partial sums is not hard to calculate in this case, and what we find out is the sequence of partial sums alternates between 1 and 0. 
Now we see the problem. This sequence diverges and therefore the series diverges. So it doesn't equal anything. That's our way out of that mess. It's not that it equals zero and it equals one and it equals two and it equals negative three. It actually doesn't equal anything because by definition, the series diverges. Now let's come full circle and look at those original series where we guess the behavior. Notice that using our definition here, the sequence of partial sums is really simple. All the partial sums are equal to zero, and of course the limiting value of that sequence is zero. So indeed, this series converges to zero. Similarly, the partial sums in this case are all equal to one, another constant sequence that converges to one in this case. And so yes, that series converges to one. And finally, this last series where each term is equal to one, well, the first partial sum is one, the second partial sum is two, third partial sum is three, the general nth partial sum is n, and of course the limit of that diverges, but it doesn't just diverge any old way, it actually diverges to infinity, and so we can carry, out, we can carry this notation out to series, and we can say, yes, indeed, this series diverges to infinity, and there you go, the behavior we expected is true.